Warning. You've reached On The Box with Ray Comfort and are now in a biblical truth zone. Place all questions about theology, current events, and evangelism on the box where they'll be weighed against the truth of God's Word. Ready your hearts and minds. You're about to be inspired and equipped to fulfill the Great Commission. Programming to engage in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to another exciting edition of On the Box with Ray Comfort. As you can tell, Ray has had some reconstructive surgery since yesterday's program, and he's not his handsome self any longer. How you doing, Ray? <laughs> Good. Thanks. Yeah, I know Ray's actually busy with Kirk, right. and uh, they're out uh, doing some witnessing at Cerritos College as we speak. Right. Ray's awesome. in the house today. Uh, would have been great, uh, or Kirk's in the house today. Would have been great to have him on with us, but they are out preaching the gospel. Mr. Brad, how are you? Doing well. Oh, that's, that's okay. Ooh, look at that. Yeah. Sharp. No, need, no need for surgery yes. for Mr. Brad. He's always looking good. Mark, you've been working on Genius. You know, I haven't seen Ray excited about a project since 180 since as he is about Genius. So how's that going? You know, th that is the case. I get in to work at 7 a.m. and Ray calls me right around 710. Uh, when can I come in? What's going on, yeah. Mac? Genius. Yeah, didn't you answer your emails at home? Can we work on this right, right now? You know, so he jumps in and he's so excited. He walks by my office and he pauses as he goes by to see what I'm working on, what I'm doing, so he can uh, sneak in and see if this is a good time for us to work together. It's nonstop with him when, when there's a project going on. I mean, there's no, it's just, that's it. That's the focus. That's what's happening. So This is the latest, greatest thing in Ray's life, right. is this whole genius. And we should have the rough draft done, Lord willing, tomorrow so we can watch it, because you're gone. Right. I've been catching some glimpses of it, and uh, yeah. it's good stuff, man. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I like it. Really good. Well, Ray and I were at Calvary Chapel Refuge in Huntington Beach last night uh, doing a 180 service. How'd that go? Oh, uh, you know, it was awesome. Your parents used to go there, didn't they? They did. Oh, they love it. They yeah. would still go. My dad said, if I ever come into like $10 million, I'm giving a good portion of it to that church. He said it to me right. last week. Right. You know, so he really likes yeah, it. Yeah, they're in the old Burlington Coat Factory uh, there, and I was surprised. I mean, I knew they were in the area, but I was surprised to discover last night that... Uh, they're just maybe about three, four hundred yards down from a gas station my family used to own right oh. there on Beach and Edinger. And, uh, and just, you know, after I got up, I was talking about my testimony and, you know, how I was slated to be aborted and how I got saved and then got delivered out of the gang life and all that. And then I was reminded of something that had happened when I worked at the gas station. Uh, one day I was working and uh, this guy started uh, crossing the street while traffic was going on Beach Boulevard, north mm. and south. And he was just walking right That's in the middle of the busy street. Oh, one of the busiest, I think, in, in California. So cars were putting on their brakes, people honking. And this guy, he was out of it, you know. And uh, I'd been a believer for a couple of years. I remember thinking, man, I'm going to give this guy a Summer Harvest Crusade uh, invitation. Yeah. I went back in the station. I think a customer got in. I got distracted. Next thing I know, helicopters flying over the place, police cars pulling in, cops with their guns, you know, going all around. And then I just hear, bam, 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 bam. I go around the corner and look. And there's the same guy lying down in a pool of blood. He had robbed what's now a BJ's, but was an El Torito right across the street. Uh, came across, went into Arby's right next door there yeah. at the mobile. I've eaten there many and, times. Um, and, you know, police surrounded the place. By that time, he comes out, pulls out a gun, oh. and they start shooting him. So after the service, a lady comes up to me and says, I cannot believe you shared that story. That was a relative of mine. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was her brother and her brother's uh, her brother's wife's uncle. And he she said when the guy got he had gotten out of prison and he went over there, and so I was just I was blown away by that. Uh, just thinking, you know, again of God's divine hand and intervention and and the fact that you know someone knew him. So, but uh, but anyhow, uh, the Lord blessed the service and uh, we had we had an awesome time, great response, and an encouragement to see that uh, you know the Lord is still working and moving. So if you have any questions, mm. any thoughts, any comments, please email us to onthebox at livingwaters.com. Check, check us out on Facebook and uh, on Twitter as well. All right, we got a great story for today. This really encouraged me and convicted me at the same time, and I'm yeah. sure it'll do the same uh, for you guys. Christians, this is by CBN News. Christians are commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Recently, CBN News met an 84-year-old New York woman who's taken that mandate to heart. She's been ministering on the streets of Manhattan for decades, Manhattan. Times Square is famous for its bright lights and Broadway shows, but beneath the neon glow, you'll find Irma Morris, 
who, was, who has dedicated her life to pointing people to the true light of the world. For more than 40 years, she's handed out tracts in the Big Apple and told people about Jesus. Although she's been in New York City since 1964, the Brazilian native still struggles with her English, but that hasn't stopped her from returning night after night to pray and witness for Christ. Wow. Times Square might seem like an unlikely place to evangelize with so many people out having fun, taking in the sights, sounds, and shows, but Maurice called Times Square the perfect place to tell people about Jesus. What do you think about that, Brad? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge for someone who, you know, has an inability to, uh, to speak English, you know, to reach out, let alone, uh, um, you know, relate to people. And uh, it just reminds me of the challenges uh, that some people have overcome to, uh, to reach out with the gospel, you know, like uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, Hi. who was bound to a wheelchair after a diving accident. And, uh, you know, she could have, you know, just, you know, left it at that and lived out her Christian walk, uh, you know, bound to a chair. But she used her inabilities uh, to reach out to the world uh, for those that were disabled, uh, providing the uh, necessary uh, equipment that people with, uh, with disabilities often need. And and uh, re she reached out with the gospel as well. And actually, you know, in thinking of her, I was reminded as a small child, I was inspired by uh, Johnny uh, because she was uh, an artist right. uh, and she uh, even though bound to a wheelchair and didn't have the use of her arms she was able to hold a pencil and, and a brush in her teeth mm. and produce amazing works of art which was an inspiration to me and that's what a, a large part of why I even entered into the art field wow I had no idea about that Brad. Yeah. well you know that that actually goes hand in hand with uh, Nick Vujicic. Nick Vujicic. Vujicic. <laughs> we're, Nick? we're trying to get his name right now to say it before yeah the you know the, he is an inspiration you know, he's got his ministry, Life Without Limbs. Mm. He came and visited us, right. you know, not too long ago. Yeah, we ago. got a picture hanging in the hallway of you, me, uh, Ray and Kirk with him. And here, here's a guy, amazing guy. He's got no arms, hmm. no legs. Right. And he is a bold ambassador for Christ. Right. And if you think of anybody, nobody would, would blink. Nobody would think otherwise if he just said, you know, I can't get out today. Right. I can't do certain things. Nobody would say, oh, yes, you can. Yeah. And he's risen above his deformities, mm. not looking at them as a deformity, but really as a platform. Right. You know, That's how many right. people do that today? Wow. You know, we look at, I've got cancer. Well, don't waste your cancer. Use your mm. cancer as a soapbox to get up and preach All because right. more eyes are on you and more ears are open to what you have to say. Yeah. And he's doing that. It's amazing. I remember for the first time seeing a story and his stuff, if you haven't seen it, by the way, check it out on YouTube, Nick Vujicic. <laughs> if you put in Nick V, his name yeah. will come up right away. Right. But it, it, I mean, yeah, you're left speechless. You know, uh, no limbs and yet no excuses. He makes no excuses right. uh, when, like you said, he could have a thousand of them. Yeah. And he's out there, you know, and, and, and just, and, and the inspiration he is to people in general. I mean, the guy's out there surfing. He's riding on skateboards. Oh. He's, he's, you know, deep sea diving. And I've never seen him fall into a pool. And I just, Ugh. Right. I know. And then he's, he goes, look, I'm just one big lung. Right. I just float. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing, and he's married now. They're having a child. Yeah, and, wow, congratulations. But, but, you know, but he's out there preaching the gospel. He's out there you know, sharing the word of God wherever he goes, and, and it's an inspiration. You know, I think of a couple different people that I know in that regard. Um, uh, a guy named Gordy. He's, uh, he's got um, you know, cerebral palsy, hmm. uh, can hardly talk, has been bound to a wheelchair all of his life. But this guy is always carrying tracts. He's always you know, trying to reach people with the gospel. Um, I think of another guy who came to one of our academies. Uh, if you remember, his name was Robin Anderson, blind guy. The blind? Oh, blind wow. guy. Uh, getting up on a soapbox. Talk about, you know, worrying about losing your balance. But he's getting up on a soapbox, wow. proclaiming the gospel with passion and love, you know. So, guys, we just want to encourage you with that. Here's, here's an 84-year-old lady going out to one of the hardest uh, parts of our nation every night faithfully preaching the gospel and making no excuses. And think of these other people that we just talked about. So be inspired by that. What's your excuse? Uh, you know, the Lord wants to use you and wants to be glorified through you. And on that note, I want to read a quote from the Evidence Bible, uh, as we have been doing on here on a daily basis. This is a quote by Alan Redpath, and it says this, when God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible man and he crushes him. 
you know, and, and how fitting is that? Uh, Alan Redpath, uh, he, uh, he moved from, uh, to the U.S. from England in 1953. He was a pastor of a, the Moody Church in Chicago. Uh, nine years later, he goes back to Great Britain, and then he, uh, he gets, uh, he gets a, a near-fatal stroke, and then he ends up, you know, recovering, but he went into a really, really deep depression. Hmm. And, you know, I think how ironic that is that he, that he said that. God takes an impossible man, someone who's least likely to be used by the Lord. He takes them, breaks them for his purposes, uh, and then he uses them. And I'm sure you've seen that done with people. Oh, boy. Your life. You know, absolutely. I, I remember the story, actually, with Alan Redpath. Um, he said he was burdened to pray for a man that he met one time. And it was Major Ian Thomas, right. Major Ian Thomas, who started Torchbearers out of Estes Park, Colorado. Uh, he's getting really old in age, but he was burdened to pray for Major Ian Thomas all night long. And he said he was not going to relent in his prayer until the burden was gone. Wow. And he found himself praying for the major all night long. And he had met him one time. Oh, man. So then they find their paths finally crossed. And uh, Alan Redpath said, hey, what was happening on this day at this time? Hmm. And Major Ian Thomas said, I was at war and I was in the front lines and everybody wow. in my platoon died <laughs> but me. Wow. But me. I mean, it's hard enough to get our friends to pray for us, right. you know, or to pray for our family at times. How about meeting somebody one time and being burdened right. for numerous hours and not relenting yeah. on that? You know, uh, to answer your question. You know, we, we have seen it and we do see it. I remember when Moses went before Pharaoh, one of his excuses was, look, Moses is a mountain and I'm but a worm. Right. But what Moses wasn't realizing when God had commissioned him to go before Pharaoh was that God specializes in using worms right. to bring down mountains. Right. It's not a big deal to have a mountain to bring down a worm if you do that then you pat yourself on the back. But God says he doesn't share his glory with right. anyone. And it's so the Lord can be magnified and that's his it. strength can be made perfect in weakness. That's it. Yeah, that's really good. Brad, do you have any uh, insight on that in terms of God using people that are broken? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I was already th ready for the next segment in my mind, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, but you think of some biblical characters too, Mark. I mean, you think of uh, Gideon, yeah. right? Um, Hey, mighty man of valor, yeah, the dude's right. hiding out in a wine press, right, <laughs> threshing. And obviously he's hiding out from the Midianites. I mean, you don't thresh wheat at, in a wine press. You do it out in an open field. But he's hiding, and the Lord chose him and used him. Um, you, you know, you noted uh, Moses. You think of David, the least of his household, right? Oh, it's right. like they're bringing out the big guns, and David's out there in the field uh, with his sheep. But, but the Lord, you know, chose him and used him. You think of some modern-day people, Oswald Chambers. Hmm. Uh, you know, that guy was a radically broken guy. Um, he went, he went through a, a period of darkness for, I think it was four years. Wow. And he said at that time, the Bible became to him the dullest, most uninteresting book in existence. Uh, and he said the only thing that kept him out of an asylum was, was the grace of God and the love and support of, of friends and loved ones. And, uh, and he was mightily used. I mean, my utmost for his eyes is probably one of the most popular devotionals of all, of all time. time. Right. Uh, and you know, and you think of Spurgeon, Spurgeon went through deep times oh. of depression. He used to go home, at, Spurgeon would go home after he preached some of his sermons and he'd be in tears that, that the message wasn't impactful or powerful enough. What's that, that do that to the rest of us, you know? And I know that feeling. Right, and you think <laughs> of how the Lord used him. And even Ray, you know, Ray went through, through a long period where he dealt with uh, agoraphobia. He would go in public, he'd see someone that he knew, he'd break out in a cold sweat, didn't know how to talk to him. He had to stop family devotions for a year. He writes about it in one of his books. And, um, and we see how the Lord uses broken people. So uh, the theme along with today's program is be encouraged. Yeah, right. Um, you know, if you're weak, then you're probably the most qualified uh, for the Lord to use for his glory. Amen. All right. We're going to turn it over to Brad. Brad's going to talk about the tool of the day. Why Christianity? Well, the tool of the day is the DVD, Why Christianity? I assume we have a graphic. I don't know. And, um, you know, what this is useful for is, you know, I know many of us uh, have those people in our lives that we struggle to present the gospel to. This gives you the resource to uh, put the gospel in front of your family and friends, uh, even p perfect strangers uh, that will present the gospel clearly and give the uniqueness of Christianity. And uh, it's, a, it's a valuable resource uh, that we uh, definitely encourage people to, to look into getting. Uh, some of the uh, feedback we've gotten from it says, uh, this is by far the 
best presentation of the gospel I've ever seen. I was clapping and cheering towards the end. A great evangelism tool to give away. I put them on the counter in the reception area with a please take one, uh, for, uh, take one free card at my insurance business, and clients are taking them five to ten a week. This is a great tool for reaching the loss. I just ordered 80. My family and I are giving them away door to door in our neighborhood, along with an information packet from our church. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, it's a useful tool for reaching out to the lost. And uh, if you have anyone in your life that you'd like to present the gospel to, but you don't have an opportunity to have a face and face encounter, uh, we would recommend using this DVD. All right. We had a lot of fun filming that. I remember uh, being on a plane and, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely a great time. And, and we've also created a, uh, a little booklet from that called Why Christianity. That's great. Yeah. And the responses uh, has been awesome. All right, we're going to move along to our World Religions in a Nutshell series. Uh, we've mentioned Ray's book, World Religions in a Nutshell. And each week, one day a week, we're going to be taking a world religion from the book, and we're going to be touching on it and talking to you about how you can be equipped to share your faith with people from that world religion. Uh, last time, we talked about Judaism, and we're kind of continuing that. We're doing that for a few weeks. What I want to do is I want to tie that in with a question that came in. I, we read you guys a question of the week last week and said we'd get to it this week, and it does touch on Judaism, so uh, it's connected. So I'll read that again, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, this is uh, from Raymond. Raymond asks, I'm a believer of Christ and had a question. I know that Jews of old shed blood of a clean animal to cover their sin commanded by God. I know Jesus was a perfect sacrifice who shed his blood for forgiveness of sins to all men. But how did Gentiles make it to heaven before Christ? Were they damned because they believed in false gods? You know, I think that the first thing that's important to establish, and Mark, I'm sure you'll concur with this, is that nobody deserves God's forgiveness. Right. You know, I, th there's, there's this perception oftentimes from people that we get like, hey, why would God uh, not save uh, you know, all of mankind. Why, why, you know, why did these people die having not heard, you know, or, or what have you? But, but we forget the fact that God owes mankind nothing but his wrath and judgment. That's right. No explanation needed. In fact, you know, with Job, all that Job went through, there was no, there's nothing written in there that God ever gave Job an explanation why he did what he did. Right. You know, God does whatever he wants. God is in heaven and he does what he pleases, the psalmist says. <laughs> You know, th this is actually a, somewhat of a difficult question in that the Bible doesn't have a lot to say right. about Gentiles uh, before the time of Christ, but we can uh, establish a foundation. Right. And the foundation is that of which salvation has always been a work of God. Mm. Um, man is saved by grace through faith. No works has ever been a part of salvation. And we can begin to build from that foundation. Yeah. That we know, first of all, that the, how were the Jews saved? The Jews were saved by looking forward to the Messiah coming right. and taking away the sins of the world. And that's why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he was so ecstatic. Right. He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Because up until that point, the sins were merely covered. But eventually they had to be dealt with. It was a foreshadowing of what was to come. That's, that's exactly so, right. Yeah, and you know, the, the point <clears> on, <throat> first of all, like I said, you know, God does not owe man redemption. All man deserves is wrath and judgment. We saw what happened at the fall, and then we see what happens in the life of indi every individual person who is a sinner, and, and as a result of that, deserves death and the wrath and judgment of God. So whenever God issues salvation, uh, it's, it's a byproduct of his grace and mercy. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, so that's the second point, is that salvation has always been by faith. And here's some, some scriptures uh, for you guys to note. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Titus 3, 4 through 5. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy... He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. 
Romans 11, 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, works is no longer works. And so we see in the New Testament model that definitely salvation is, is by grace through faith. Uh, but I think sometimes a mistake that people make, uh, and Brad, maybe you can comment on this, is that oftentimes people will uh, have the perspective that it was different in the Old Testament or under the Old Covenant. Do you ever get that, Brad? Well, yeah, I think we don't have a lot to go on in the Old Testament to suggest that the Gentiles were included in the promise prior to the cross, like we do see in the New Testament. Right. And I think, you know, people have this idea that there's some sort of fairness that needs to be spread throughout time, all time, all over the world. And it's just like Mark said, you know, God does what he pleases. And, and this is according to God's plan. Right. I think it's important to note, too, that... Um, it was the same under the Old Covenant as it is in the New. And, and here are some passages in that regard, dealing primarily first with Abraham. Then he, Abraham, this is Genesis 15, 6, believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then Paul comments on this in Galatians 3, 5 through 9. He says, Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So there he is citing that passage from uh, Genesis 15. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. And so, you know... Um, of course, this is in connection with uh, Genesis 12, 3, where, where God said to Abraham, and in you all the nations or all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So it's always been a faith. It's yeah. always been a gift of God's grace. Uh, and yet, even those who were saved in the Old Testament era um, were also covered by the blood of Christ. I mean, the cross took place at a, at a, certain, uh, at a certain time in, in time and space, you know, when it did. But but retrospectively, all those who looked forward, those godly Jews who looked forward to the Messiah that was to come, are, are covered and the, the blood of Christ is appropriated to them because they believe by faith. Yeah, you know, there, there is one passage here that uh, you, you can wrestle over if you'd like if you deal with this question. And I see that in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, these are Gentiles. Right. You know, we have Ephesus there in Asia Minor. And this is the passage that he brings out in verse 12. He says that at that time you were without Christ. Who? The Gentiles. Right. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Right. So, in my little research that I've done on this uh, this text, which is a very good question, I mean, it's a, it's very, an very excellent genuine. question. People pose it all the time. <laughs> hey, what about those before Christ came, or you know, or and we'll touch on them. What about those who even before Abraham called Abraham out and God right. called Abraham out, and then Judaism was established? Right. So I, I would I lean more towards that the Gentiles in the Old Testament were without hope. Right. They, that God set His affection, His attention upon. Uh, the Jewish people for reasons known only to him right. and that the Gentiles were without hope during that time. But there's some questions that you got to deal with with that. Yeah. You got Melchizedek who was a priest of the Most High God who some say is this a Christophany? Right. Some think so, some think not, but he was a Gentile. Right. You You've know, got Jethro. Jethro, the, the father of Moses. Right. Yeah, a, a, exactly. Who seemed to be, a, you know, one who feared God. But then, you know, here let me, let me let me finish up with this. This is why this question is so important to me. Yeah. And and that is, this is why we need to go out into the highways and the byways and tell people about Jesus. Amen. Because we throw this question up almost as an objection against God, and we go no further. Right. But really, this is why the love letter was written, hmm. so that we go into the 1040 window. We go across the street, or we go into the supermarket, and open up our mouths as we out, because how will they hear unless the preacher is sent? Amen. And then the final thought is this. If they can get saved without Christ, then we should not send missionaries into these remote tribes in the world. We should be sending construction workers who could build a big moat around there, lest somebody who's a Christian go into that village, tell them about Jesus, wow. they reject Jesus, right. 
and now they're accountable. That's such a good point. Yeah, because there is that perspective. Uh, if people haven't heard, uh, then well, hey, there, you know, then then there's there's no there's no accountability. In that case, then, like Mark's saying, we need to keep anyone from hearing because right. hey, then by that definition, they would be saved. But you know, again, it's important to note there were those who looked forward to the Messiah. Uh, you think of you think of uh, Simeon in Luke two. Uh, you think of Anna. I mean, they were looking forward to the Messiah. Simeon, you know, held Christ up and, and rejoiced mm. uh, to, to see his day. It says, he, it says um, he, he was a devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So the mm. Jews back then were looking forward to the Christ. They just rejected Jesus as being that Christ. Right. Today we know they're looking forward to the Messiah. But for, the, for, for those who looked forward to the Messiah, those who attached themselves to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the Gentile world and looked forward to the Messiah, had the hope of salvation. Those that, that lived before uh, God had, had chosen Abraham and established Judaism and there was widespread knowledge about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, again, like Mark cited from Ephesians, uh, there was that general sense that the Gentiles had not yet been grafted in. But... In the final analysis, we know that God is just. You're right. We, knows, we know that he knows the heart of every person. We know that there, like Roman talks about, every man is without excuse. There's that general revelation that God has given. When people pursue it, God gives that special revelation. There's so many stories of, of missionaries that, that, that have been out on the field who tell about these people who had no idea uh, about who Christ was because of contact through a missionary. And they can encounter them and realize that these people had received divine you know, knowledge that God had given, and then he sent him a missionary to give them more. You know? oh. So anyhow, uh, be encouraged, guys, and know that God is sovereign. He reigns upon the throne. It's his mercy that he gives salvation, uh, and what a blessing that he does. So go out and share that with others, and uh, please be sure to join us tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be talking about Richard Dawkins getting a copy of 180. God bless you. For questions about On the Box with Ray Comfort or to submit questions for future shows, please email onthebox at livingwaters.com. That's onthebox at livingwaters.com. On the Box with Ray Comfort is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel. Thank <laughs> you.